So in this section of chapter 14, we're going to be looking at the interactions of animal viruses and their hosts. So make sure my volume's turned all the way up. One of the terms that we need to refer to when we look at the interaction between a virus and its host cell is what's known as balanced pathogenicity. It's when a virus infects and persists within a host that neither the cell is harmed nor the virus. So a virus wants to get in, it wants to reproduce, it wants to replicate, and it has to take over the cell, and that obviously does the cell harm. But in order for the virus to get out, it has to be able to be released from the host cell or host organism and infect new cells or a new organism. Now, the idea of balanced pathogenicity is the idea that it gets in and causes enough disease that it doesn't get caught but yet at the same time doesn't go so far as to kill the virus or kill the host cell. So viruses that cause human infections can be characterized as either um, causing acute infections, and we refer to those as acute viruses, or they can be known as persistent infections, and so then we call them persistent viruses. Acute infections are short duration, um, and the host develops long-lasting immunity, meaning if you get sick with it, you won't ever get sick again. Um, a persistent infection is different in that the virions are continually present in the body. The, the immune system doesn't ever actually really get rid of the virus, and they're released from the cells by budding, so they're leaked slowly over long periods of time. So we're going to be focusing today on the acute infections. Um, and we're going to look specifically at viral replication. And you probably studied viral replication in biology. Hopefully you remember that there were five basic stages, right? Attachment, entry, replication, assembly, and release. Now, you may or may not remember that, but in microbiology, when we look at the replication cycle more specifically, um, there's actually even more um, steps that are involved. So we're going to be looking at step one, attachment. And I've got an image in my lower right-hand corner. Yours is located in a different spot on your note packet. But basically, attachment is how does the virus find its host cell? They're non-living, so how do they even get attached? Well, those spikes are glycoproteins of the virus attached to the glycoproteins of the host cell. So they're, they match. They're like a lock and key fit. Usually, more than one receptor is needed for attachment. And those receptors can be anywhere from tens to hundreds of thousands. Okay, the only difference is HIV actually only needs two different glycoproteins to bind, to bind, not tens to hundreds of thousands. Significant difference in amount there. So basically, what we see is what I have colored here with, in turquoise. Those are the glycoproteins or spikes, and they're going to attach to those surface receptors on the host cell. And that is what's going to stimulate the cell to take the virus in. So that kind of leads us to the second step, and that's entry. And entry varies depending if the virus is enveloped or not. So we're going to look at a couple of different ways viruses can actually get into a cell. Fusion is the first way, and this is for an enveloped virus. The viral envelope is literally left on the surface of the cell, so let's take a look at it. Basically, we get membrane fusion after attachment occurs, and it looks like the host cell membrane, which I left clear here, is going to eventually engulf that virus. Now the issue is, is instead of engulfing, it literally takes from right here, rips that apart, and actually the viral envelope becomes continuous then with the host cell membrane. So we have fusion there between that viral membrane and the host cell membrane, releasing the naked nucleocapsid to the inside of the cell. So then we have to get, um, we have to have what's called uncoding occur. And this right here is uncoding. Basically the nucleic acid has to come out of the capsid. The second way an enveloped virus might be able to enter a cell is through endocytosis, and this is a process you studied in biology as well. The viral envelope is ripped off of the virus inside of the cell and then broken down. 
So now the viral envelope is not left externally to the cell. So let's look at this process. We get the virus, it attaches, right? It induces the cell to take it in in what we know as a vacuole. So now we get the extra layer of the host cell membrane over here all the way engulfing that turquoise viral envelope and then what I've colored in kind of a magenta nucleocapsid. So we have to have that uncoating again. Well, now once that vacuole's on the inside, the host cell membrane literally rips off the envelope so that way it exposes that nucleocapsid and then uncoating can occur. Now, naked viruses, this is at the top of the next page, okay, naked viruses use endocytosis only. The virus dissolves the vesicle, releasing the nucleocapsid once inside the cell. There's no envelope, so it doesn't get ripped off. Now, if I were to go back, how might this be bad for a virus to use fusion? Okay. Think about it. The virus, once inside of a host cell, wants to hide out. It doesn't want to get caught by your immune system. So by leaving its protein spikes, its glycoproteins, external to the cell, that means the immune system can come around and check these and say, huh, looks like a virus is on the inside of this cell and destroy it. Whereas if we look at this example, on the surface of the cell, there's no indication that there's any virus. There are no glycoproteins. So endocytosis is actually a little bit sneakier. Now, once inside, and if you would, in your notes, flip-flop these two. Literally just go ahead and draw one of those arrows, okay? Because these two actually go in reverse order, okay? Uncoating actually comes first, right? Uncoating occurs, the nucleic acid has to get separated from its protein coat prior to the start of replication. Then it can go in and target the site of replication. But here's the thing, we've talked about this a little bit. When DNA viruses enter, where is the virus going to reproduce? Where does it have to go first? Well, a DNA virus has to go straight to the nucleus, right? Me and my really bad mouse handwriting here. You'd think one of these days I get better at this. And then RNA viruses, where do they go? Well, they go straight to, ooh, that's a really lovely R, ribosomes. Okay, so I'm going to abbreviate and just write ribose. <laughs> Fun. Now, once that occurs, once the DNA or the RNA, that naked nucleic acid, gets to its target site of replication, actual replication and protein synthesis can start to occur. So this depends on whether the virus is DNA or RNA, whether it's single-stranded or double-stranded. Either way, the nucleic acid is replicated separately from the proteins, and messenger RNA must be made. Okay? If enzymes are required for any process, whether it's DNA polymerase or RNA polymerase or helicase or um, doesn't really matter, the virus has to rely on the cell's enzymes to complete the process if it has a really small genome. It may have a larger genome, um, and then it may code for the production of the viruses it needs. You don't know, okay? So there's two options there for the virus. Now, once it moves on into the next stage, we've got lots of um, viral capsids made, made out of those proteins. We've got lots of nucleic acids made. Then we've got maturation. This is where the proteins are all assembled, made into capsids, the nucleic acid gets put inside so it becomes a nucleocapsid, and then we get to the final stage, which is release. This is how the virus exits the host cell, um, and that depends on where it replicates and if it's enveloped. If it's naked, it can cause what's known as cell degradation. Now I know that that light blue is kind of hard to see against the gray. Cell degradation is when the cell disintegrates over time because it doesn't produce its own proteins anymore. Lysis occurs when the cells explode. They literally burst open because of excess viruses and parts being produced. Some viruses actually release an enzyme that degrades the cell membrane of the host cell, so that way it purposely explodes it. Now, in some cases, the cell doesn't die right away. 
and this is where sometimes we see what are known as cytopathic effects. These are long-term effects on cells even though they continue to live even after being infected by a virus. <coughs> Enveloped viruses are released via two different methods. They can either be released using budding, where a region on the cell membrane called the lipid raft is produced where all of the proteins and the matrix is put down and it's kind of floating there in the cytoplasm. This area then is where the viruses bud out and they literally rip a piece of that host cell envelope with them. Exocytosis is the exact opposite of endocytosis. So a vacuole is produced and then the vacuole releases the virus out into the environment. Now, I kind of want to go back and take a look at one of those pictures because the lipid raft kind of looks just like this. Okay, So that process, budding, looks just like this but in reverse. So let's say we start down here. I've got the naked nucleocapsid. The lipid raft gets produced. It and it goes, the, the virus goes up to the lipid raft and literally ends up pushing out, pushing that virus out and taking part of the cytoplasm, or sorry, part of the cell membrane with it. Oop, one too far. Now the last two things we have to talk about don't really have to do with the virus inside of a cell, but the virus inside of a, um, a host organism. So this is where shedding from the host occurs. So the virus has to leave the host organism from the same surface or opening that it gained entrance from. Now we talked about this a little bit with classification. We talked about respiratory viruses. Typically, you get them because you breed them in. They get in through your respiratory tract. Well, guess what? That's where they're shed from, so that's how they get out. Okay. We talked about enteric viruses, fecal oral route. You're ingesting something contaminated with feces? Well, that means that's where it's passing out of you. <laughs> And so that's how it's shed. Then transmission is how the virus enters a new host. And that might be through direct contact um, or indirect contact. And we're going to talk more about that in our next unit.